Advocacy. Um, she recently founded the State Revolving Fund Advocates Forum, which is a national table of nonprofits working collaboratively to inform water infrastructure investment practices uh, in the United States and in the Great Lakes to prioritize equity and climate resilience. Uh, we'll be hearing from Scott Goldstein, who is a lecturer, who has been a lecturer at the School of Professional Studies, uh, Masters of Public Policy Administration program, um, focusing on global and urban policy since 2008. For the past four years, Scott has led the Global Policy Lab, an externship program with a nonprofit sponsor, such as the Alliance for the Great Lakes, focused on researching and developing recommendations for a particular public policy challenge. Scott also serves as principal of Tesca Associates, an urban planning, development economics, and landscape architecture firm. And then we'll be hearing also from Sam Grunholm, uh, who is currently a university lecturer at the Obo Ac Academy University, teaching courses in public administration in environmental multi-level governance. His research interests include environmental multi-level governance in the Baltic Sea region and comparative urban climate governance in the European Union. He's worked as a project manager in the Baltic 21 unit tasked to further sustainable development within the intergovernmental network of the Council of the Baltic Sea States, which sounds uh, very similar to some of the councils and associations we have here in the Great Lakes. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, so for, first, I'd like to hear um, from uh, Annalisa, Scott, and, and Sam, uh, just a few words of introduction about the course that they built together. And I want to make sure that you know each of each of you shares a bit with our audience about um, you know one reason why you felt this exchange uh, across these two watersheds um, was worthy of, of of digging into through this course. So, Annalisa, why don't you start us off? Great, thanks, Joel. Um, I think to start, just illustrating for for folks watching. Uh, what regions we're talking about and what the course covered uh, would be helpful. So if I could ask Allison to flip through those slides, just briefly, we'll cover that and then I'll I'll share my why. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this should look familiar to most folks. We've got, um, I did my best trying to get this to scale, but we've got the Great Lakes watershed on one side and the Baltic Sea on another. Um, the Great Lakes, uh, North American Great Lakes are the largest surface freshwater uh, resources in the world. And the Baltic Sea is home to, I think it's 12 countries in the catchment basin and nine bordering the sea. Sam will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which is a brackish uh, water uh, that's home to lots of economic development similar to the Great Lakes. Um, next slide, please. I will let my colleagues introduce themselves, um, but just so you can see here, the partners involved, um, Scott, who you'll hear from, Nina and Sam at Obo Academy. Um, Nina could not be with us, but we're lucky to have Sam joining us. It's evening uh, in, in Finland, um, so thank you for making the time. Uh, and then that's me with the Alliance. And then last slide. Super quickly, um, the, the topics that we covered um, were really a survey of some of the core issues that we discussed from both the Great Lakes and um, Baltic Sea perspective, some of the shared challenges around um, democracy and clean water, restoration and climate resilience, environmental justice and clean water access, and agriculture and clean water. And I think we can stop the screen share and just start to have a conversation unassisted. Thank you. Um, so with that grounding, um, it looks like I've got a little bit of a lag here, uh, but with that grounding, I will say the, the reason what that I was very much drawn to this collaboration um, is simply just the opportunity to look around the world and, and ask other clean water experts and leaders how they address some of the shared challenges that we face here in the Great Lakes region. And I will kick it off to um, one of my colleagues here. I don't know, Sam or Scott, if you wanna jump in. There you go for Sam. All right, thank you. Um, my, I actually had two whys, uh, the interest of this course. One is um, uh, a teaching perspective. Uh, I'm a teacher in public administration, 
uh, and I specifically looked forward to different um, fields of methodologies in how you teach uh, as opposite to the Finnish version. So I really in, in, in looked forward to the more interactive version that uh, is more of a US based. That's the first why. The second why relates to the C profile at Obo Academy. Uh, the C profile, it's an interdisciplinary approach, trying to understand the transboundary problems of the C. So we are rather multi-dimensional and transdisciplinary. We are public administration, public uh, political scientist. We have industrial economists and uh, amongst other marine biologists. So we try to work together. And this course offered, offered an opportunity to learn from other areas as well. Oftentimes you learn more when you look to other areas and look to your own areas in the sense that you something take things for granted in your own area. So you need to have wide eyes a spectrum. And in that sense, that my two wise shortly. So I give over to Scott. Thanks everyone. Annalise in particular for coming up with the idea of this course and Sam was a pleasure co-teaching with you and needed uh, taken in um, over the spring along with Annalisa. Um, I just have to back up a little bit. I, I think this course is really exciting to go to the next level of this partnership with ABO. Um, this is something we've been building towards for a while. Nancy Ferguson, who I believe is in the webinar, came to me four or five years ago saying, we just piloted a new course that's really applied and looking at this new idea of an externship. In other words, partnering with an organization like the Alliance. And it's been uh, such a pleasure to work with the MPBA students on really applying what they've learned in other classes to real world situations. So part of this is we really tried to apply this um, not only learning styles, but application per, per terms of people's career growth. And whether you're a public policy practitioner for a local or state or federal government, or consultant like me who advises local governments or private businesses, or someone working in um, a larger um, firm, these skills of taking data analysis of such a complex issues, and we made it more complex comparing the Great Lakes to uh, the Baltic Sea and coming up with recommendations. We'll talk about that in a little bit because I think the work that was done that was excellent. The other why is just the importance of the issue. It's just a couple of stats. 84% of North America's surface water is in the Great Lakes. Over 20% of the world's fresh water supply is in the Great Lakes. And one of the commonalities that I learned with Finland is uh, we here in the Great Lakes take water for granted. So we read every day about Arizona, the Colorado River and California and Texas. And yet we just run the taps and don't even think about it. And so we can talk about that some more, but uh, the importance of both water supply and water quality in these two regions and, and how we govern those scarce resources is so important. And looking at two different international structures between the Great Lakes Compact, which includes the United States, uh, the, the Great Lakes states, the seven Great Lakes states, that Annalisa showed in two provinces compared to uh, uh, the European model it was really fascinating. Thanks, Scott, Sam, and Annalisa. Um, and Annalisa, welcome back. Uh, I guess I had to drop out there for a second, so hopefully we'll go with no more no more hiccups here for the rest of the time. Uh, those of you who are on the webinar, if you want to ask questions, you know, please put them in the chat. I will uh, pay attention to them, and we'll get to them later in this conversation. But for now, I'm going to start uh, just with a few questions of my own for our panelists. And you know, Scott, that was a good tee up uh, for my my opening. We talked in our prep work for this webinar, I can't remember who coined this, but you know, the, the idea that the, the Baltic Sea region and the Great Lakes are both freshwater superpowers, um, which I know has sort of, you know, militaristic overtones, but we'll leave that to the side, unless you don't want to. Talk to me, you know, each of you share a little bit about what that idea of being a freshwater superpower means, you know, from your perception um, in the region that you're, mo that you're most familiar with. I start this time. Um, you know, like I said, I think we learned early on. So, so Baltics is, is brackish waters, um, but but you've got these great underwater uh, underground resources. Illinois is very complicated because we we have water supply from the Great Lakes. The Chicago Diversion back in 1899 reversed the flow of Chicago River, 
and our sewer system dumps the other way into the Mississippi Basin and, and into the Gulf of Mexico, which is the only large exception to the Great Lakes. And, and so we, we take the Great Lakes water, we then remove it from the Great Lakes after we use it, and, 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 and we lose that water. We, we have um, aquifers here as well, um, and those are in strained and grown areas. Um, we could talk about it later, but you're starting to have uh, relationships across former political adversaries over the scarce use of water. And then we've got uh, Peter Annan's Great Lakes Water Wars. If you haven't read it yet, it's a great reading. It's not very academic, but it's a gripping read over the, the struggle um, of other and, and, and other parts of the country that want to essentially uh, drain the Great Lakes for their water needs. When we have all this infrastructure in the Chicago area and other Great Lakes cities, um, but we're losing population. That population is shifting to the south and the west where there's not uh, available water supply. And yet those costs are all hidden. So I'll leave it at that and let Sam jump in from his perspective. Thank you, Scott. I was thinking about this um, water superpowers, especially in the Nordic context. Uh, this is one thing that this course taught me is that we, at least in the Nordic countries, I mean, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, we take water for granted. That's such plentiful uh, tap water. I mean, in the sense that, for example, you look uh, to Europe as a context today, um, southern parts of Europe, it's, uh, I think they're experiencing extraordinary heat waves at the moment. There's scarcity of water almost everywhere. We don't have that issue in the Nordics. And this is one thing that this course told me that we should not take water for granted. Uh, water is, it's, it's not in any sense privatized in the Nordics, it's a public. Uh, on the local level through the national level, nobody owns the water and nobody even reflects upon it. One of these uh, outcomes for me, at least to the course is that you have a lot of problems with lead piping in the US, which is a non-issue in the Nordics in general. There could be some small issues here and there, but this is something that we don't even debate and perhaps we should. And this is something that this course, at least this comparison between these areas, at least for me as a teacher, but also our students, we didn't even reflect upon before. So I leave it, give it over to Annalisa to continue the discussion. Sure, um, I, think, I think Scott and Sam um, hit on some very important points. I think we, we, we too in the Great Lakes region, um, can can find ourselves taking water for for granted, and that has manifested in in both in like Scott was saying, uh, being being late or being uh, waiting until we hit sort of critical junctures like the depletion of aquifers before we really start to take seriously how we work with the abundance of water that we have. Um, and also recognizing that only 1% of the Great Lakes is rechargeable year over year. So how to steward those resources best and how to manage development, how to recognize the, the resource that they that the Great Lakes are um, in driving economic development um, are, are challenges that we are going to be addressing for, for years to come. And at the same time, um, and Scott mentioned the, the lead service line issue that we have in so many drinking water systems in the Great Lakes region, we have allowed a backlog of water infrastructure to pile up to the point where, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars will need to be invested in even in each sub region and e within um, single water systems uh, within the Great Lakes. And there are, of course, um, because of the history of the of U.S. development, um, there are legacies of redlining. There are legacies of, of disparities within those municipal water systems. Um, so even though we have this abundant freshwater resource in our own backyard, not everyone in the Great Lakes region is able to, to really rely on the on safe, clean, affordable water. Um, and so when I think about freshwater superpower status, um, just having access to clean water um, or having water in, in the region um, is not always the the same thing as saying everybody within the Great Lakes region um, can benefit from that. And so that's the challenge that we're facing. So in, in, in that sense, you know, we are both um, deeply fortunate and we have a big responsibility that's going to take a lot of effort and investment moving forward. 
one as I'm listening to this to these thoughts, one of the things that goes through my mind is how being a superpower can make you um, actually, you know, overly comfortable and, you know, forget about um, the things that might be challenges either presently and in the future. And I think that is one of the one of the things we face in the Great Lakes in the U.S. is that, you know, get, gotten so comfortable with this idea that there's so much water here that we don't have to, we literally do not have to think about it as much as we should. Um, I want to get, and I also, I was interested in your comment, Scott, about the, the, so how this, this issue ends up shaping and reshaping political alliances. And we'll get to that in a second. Are there other, uh, you talk, we've talked about a few key stresses. I've heard aquifer depletion, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure challenges. Are there other key stresses that you all think really rise to the top in terms of shaping the public policy dialogue in the Baltic region or in the Great Lakes region that we haven't touched on yet? Well, I, I, uh, one of the commonalities came up with the agriculture runoff and eutrophication, and I hadn't really realized that when you look at both the uh, water quality issues, uh, Great Lakes was breadbasket for, for the United States, um, very inefficient use of water. You've seen it in the news now in terms of corn and ethanol, which is a huge water user, um, and the debate over um, electric cars, electric vehicles, and so you've got competing environmental goals, and it relates to the politics. So if you're going to work on stormwater legislation, for example, you have to look at the Farm Bureau, you have to look at home builders, and you have to look at local municipalities that all assume a low cost of water. And so there are a number of things that are difficult um, on, the, on the challenge side. On the positive side is water isn't necessarily a big R, big D um, political issue. Everybody needs water. And so we have found a lot of cases, a lot of students, and I see one of them um, is in this uh, room now, um, really focused in on positive examples of local or regional cooperation at, at a fairly local level. Um, and so we can talk about governance at the larger level, Sam, and talk about the EU and national. Um, but, but here, you know, Great Lakes Compact gives an overall framework, but at the end of the day, it's local regulations and incentives that are gonna influence policy. So I think this whole dynamics of this interplay um, of an issue that only hits the news, as Annalisa said, when there's a crisis, right? So we worked on stormwater management. Well, we timed the, the legislative push right after a water drought. That's how it works in Illinois. You need a crisis. Otherwise, they're not gonna get that, that, that attention. Uh, but we find a lot of commonalities of land use and its interaction and, and impact on, on the environment. I could continue on that topic, especially in the Baltic Sea context. I think the, we have many water challenges. I mean, on, on one hand, we are a superpower when it comes to freshwater, but the Baltic Sea is, I think, is one of the most contaminated seas in the world. Uh, we have uh, many transboundary policy challenges that can't be solved by one particular country. Uh, as Annalisa alluded to, there are many different nations trying to work together. And this is a non-political area. No, nobody tries to make politics of water issues or challenges in, in the Baltic Sea. And perhaps the most, uh, I wouldn't say the biggest, but the most evident problem is eutrophication the algae blooming in the summers and where I'm for example at the moment I'm around 300 miles south of the arctic circle near the shoreline and there's an archipelago here as well and there are a lot of archipelago areas in Sweden and in Finland and these and, and many people have summer cottages where I am actually in a summer cottage at the moment and this is the first place where people realize the severity when we have green algae blooming. You can't go into the water. And this is something that has, has been a wake up call since the 80s and 90s in the Baltic Sea region. And there have been a lot of transnational cooperation, even with the former Soviet Union, Russia, before the crisis in, in Crimea and, and Ukraine, there were really good cooperations. I mean, for example, Finland uh, financed uh, the building of a, a, a sewage plant, a water treatment plant in St. Petersburg, which has around 5 million inhabitants, as much as many people live in entire Finland. So there's a lot of uh, good learning experience in that sense. But uh, in general, I would argue that politics don't come to play in this specific field. There are other issues that politics arise, but with regard to water challenges, no. So, um, Alisa, are you going to jump in? 
or uh, well i just i wanted to say um something that that i think ties actually both to to scott and sam's remarks i think on that that piece of stormwater management i think that's the flip side of abundance is climate change has brought significantly significant increase in pre precipitation um and that of course creates new infrastructure demands um and on the I, you mentioned ethanol and, and um, electrification, Scott, and I, I, I'm just reminded we had students writing about offshore wind in the Baltic Sea region for, for their policy briefs through the course. And that's something that we see here in the Great Lakes um, as a new sort of push, both in Cleveland and legislation in Illinois. Um, but on that piece about the political landscape and cooperation with, with Russia, for example, you know, one topic that came up in um in the Finnish cohort was the sort of policy of non-cooperation since the war in Ukraine through um, structures like Helcom, the Helsinki Commission. Um, and and while you know in the US we don't have um uh, an, an easy corollary to that, um Scott mentioned that the clean water work is largely a bipartisan um priority uh, and yet we see pretty big disparities in terms of where we think funding, um, where, where, where public dollars should be spent. Um, and, and that often does break down on, on partisan lines in the US and the, the funding of, of environmental agencies for regulatory purposes, and even just in providing technical assistance to get federal funding out the door. So um, just, I, I think when you ask about sort of additional considerations, there are there are these other, um, drivers at play uh, that we can think about as part of the the landscape that shapes clean water in in both regions. I've got a. Um, I was I was curious to hear that comment, Sam, about the uh, you know people in cottages noticing problems uh, early on, and there there is some of that in the Great Lakes too. There is some sort of sent sentinels, people in re in recreational or tourism based communities that tend to notice things and get attention uh in ways that sometimes people in who are who are dealing with some of these sort of embedded long-term problems in cities don't so that's an interesting comparison there um let's dig in a bit more now into the governance side of things since that's the clearly that's where the the mines are, are headed um so you know we have here in the great lakes where i am it's a it's an international it's a binational uh governance system uh it's also multinational because we have a lot of indigenous nations who are part of the governance system as well in both the countries of the of US and Canada, um, and of course, state and local governments. Where do you see uh, in these respective watersheds where that transboundary collaboration has been most effective? Um, and, and I'll just, pre I'll, you know, I'll say uh, as a little bit of bias from the from the moderator, um, people are often when they think about sort of transboundary negotiations, they're trying to balance like how much time do I spend here versus time spending, you know, elsewhere, you know, and, and having an impact. And so where do you see that those transboundary collaborations have been really important at driving um, ecosystem management or, or, or ecosystem improvement in, in your watershed? I could start. I mean, just to get an overview of the Baltic Sea, how it's governed. There are different layers of government and governance. Uh, the biggest one is the macro regional level where we usually re uh, refer to European Union. And European Union has certain jurisdiction in especially in terms of fishing, uh, but also some energy aspects to it. But the most important one is the national level. And this is also be the most efficient level of government in order to deal with these problems of the Baltic Sea. And these um, transnational cooperation between different governments transpire with the, we are different specific des designated networks of which Annalise referred to Helsinki Commission. Helsinki Commission is, was founded in the 1970s. And this is perhaps the most important one in terms of an ecosystem approach or management to the Baltic Sea, dealing with areas, policy issues where there are a lot of uh, uncertainty, trying to learn as we go. And the, Bal uh, the Helsinki Commission has this Baltic Sea action plan where there has different hotspot zones, where, for example, one of them is where the, the St. Peter, Petersburg uh, lack of a 
water facility treatment plant. Now it's in place, has been for many years, financed by Finland, for example. And these hotspots have been reduced to uh, or been improved over time. But still, there, this, uh, as many marine biologists within the sea profile takes, the, these, the reversal of this takes decades. It's, it's really tricky to, we have done a lot of progress, but it takes time. And uh, politicians are impatient sometimes, and also people. So it's a little bit tricky, tricky part to, uh, to navigate. I can jump in. Um, most of my professional focus has been domestic lately, um, but I, I can think of, of a few examples, and Joel, you, you probably can think of several more, um, of transboundary cooperation on Great Lakes priorities. Um, thinking about that issue of eutrophication, which we see in both watersheds, um, we do have in the Western Lake Erie Basin an issue with um, toxic algal blooms uh, and a joint commitment between the states of Ohio, um, Michigan, and the province of Ontario to reduce nutrient runoff that fuels um, the, the eutrophication issue there. Um, in terms of the, the progress towards that goal, um, I'm not prepared to give an update, um, but we see those types of examples. And, and similar in on the issue of invasive species, Canada's regulations around ballast water treatment of ships to stop the spread of invasive species within the lakes has become a model that we point to when we work with the federal government uh, in, in the US. Um, and then even thinking about cross state um, collaborations and to some degree with, with Canada as well. Um, I was recently part of um, the Great Lakes Commission's work to develop a blueprint for uh, clean water infrastructure, and that's related right to that infrastructure investment um, that, that you mentioned in my in my introduction, um, Joel. But getting getting broad buy-in and consensus around goals and investment in um, both water treatment and delivery systems is certainly something that um, we see in in the exchange between um, the U.S. and Canada around Great Lakes health and and clean water priorities. I'm a local guy, right? So, uh, you know, I help communities plan very locally, sometimes down to a very specific site. So the big picture, you've got water policy similar to the EU. You've got Great Lakes Compact saying a framework. You've got uh, the federal government Clean Water Act was 1972. So we're 51 years in, still trying to implement what was passed in the Nixon administration. Um, and then you've got the Supreme Court uh, going back and forth on wetlands, which is a huge issue. Um, so when I'm uh, working with a local community, I work with a lot of disinvested communities. Um, water is really critical. So water is one of the top reasons why people have uh, lose their homes. So in Illinois law for abandonment, uh, there's three, three um, pieces of evidence that are admissible in court for the government to take your property. One is not paying your taxes. The second is not paying your water bill. And the third is the property is abandoned. So one out of those three causes is back water bill. So our water is very expensive. You know, you guys have worked on that. So that's a real issue. On the plus side, uh, the Calumet work that you guys are involved in is critical. So across states, across a lot of disinvested communities, across the south side of Chicago, which is the most disinvested part of Chicago, but even more concerning is the south suburbs that don't have the tax resources that the city of Chicago has. So I think that that's been a really great example of very local cooperation in a former industrial area with the highest poverty rates in Chicago, where people are using the idea of restoring the waterways and trails as an engine of economic growth. Meaning if we can embrace the waterways and the transportation network, we can, um, we've got this great natural resource that we can um, build tourism um, and local industries in, in a much cleaner way in the past. So that's one example. The other example I could think of, again, pretty local, is stormwater management. Because of huge flooding in the past, we now have countywide stormwater um, um, in, in all of the urbanized areas of northeastern Illinois and around St. Louis. Um, it's not permitted in other parts of the state. So you can't even pass legislation to quite to require countywide stormwater management. Sam's probably looking at us like we're absolutely crazy. 
But, you know, that's the way it was here before. And then still on water supply, you can go dig a well and not tell anybody in Illinois. There's basically, you're supposed to report that you've dug a well, um, but there's no regulation. You don't need any permits in Illinois to, to take water from the aquifer. You can just go out there and do it. So I'll leave with a little bit of optimism and a little bit of pessimism. Well, th thank you all for those examples. It's, you know, it, it's such a, I can think of examples from the international level down to the municipal level, like you're talking about, Scott, where, tra where transboundary collaboration has resulted in effective water outcomes. And it's so important to lift those examples up and kind of tailor how we spend our time to where they can be most successful. You mentioned that, Scott, you mentioned the Great Lakes Compact a couple of times. And just so people, you know, everybody on the call knows what that is, it's this interstate, interprovincial agreement to that in the U.S., has the force of federal law uh, that actually determines how the states are allowed to and not allowed to use the Great Lakes water supply. And there's a similar agreement in Canada at the provincial level. That's pretty remarkable. Um, and those kinds of those kinds of legal and regulatory approaches to water use transboundary just don't come across don't come up very often. Um, and so that doesn't mean that that approach works for everything, but they're good examples that you've all shared. Um, yeah, I know we want to we want to have time to get to sort of the 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 way that this this learning happened, and I and I want to jump into that in, in a moment. But um, before I do that, do you see and this? Maybe this is a good bridge to there. Um, do you see? I know I know culture and values are can be kind of slippery concepts, but do you see any particular sort of distinctly Great Lakesy or distinctly Baltic? sort of cultural val or values um, attributes that shape how this, you know, water policy and approaches to water management happen in your region um, that you think are are sort of particular to your region or to the people who live there and, and are things that are worth re replicating elsewhere, or perhaps that are make the work more challenging. I could try to start explaining that. It links both to what Joe mentioned and earlier what Scott mentioned. Um, one thing we should highlight more is the success stories. Uh, one of those relates to a network in the, in the Baltic Sea. It's called Union of Baltic Cities, established in the early 1990s, uh, linking a network on a voluntary basis over 100 cities of different sizes of different, located in all these 11 countries in the Baltic Sea. And what has happened, we talked about eutrophication, for example, and it's a good linkage to the cultural aspect as well. What has happened since the late 1990s, mid 1990s after the collapse of Soviet Union, there's been a knowledge transfer, a financial transfer with the help of EU funding to as I mentioned previously, St. Petersburg, but all over the, the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, have received help from their peers of similar sizes in the Nordic countries' cities, helping them on a peer-to-peer-based learning how to deal with uh, water treatment, even to Belarus. And this has helped a lot with regard to eutrophication, even though we still have problems. But this is some you know, cultural... A cultural socioeconomic success story where we have cities, even though they operate in different cultural contexts, socioeconomical preconditions to deal with different things, both on a monetary basis, where they have come together on a voluntary basis for the last 20 or 30 years or so on. And this has been highly successful. And this is something that perhaps is not recognized enough, especially outside the Baltic Sea region. Union of Baltic Cities is, is, is this network. It's still active. Well, that's that's really helpful. I think, you know, an important distinction between these watersheds, right, when we talk about culture and, and, and values, um, is that the, what Scott, what Sam is highlighting um, around collaboration, that's spanning different management cultures, different political landscapes, different languages. And here in the Great Lakes region, um, the decision making is happening largely in the same language among um, folks who have similar approaches to to management and public policy. Um, so that's a that's a big distinction. But when I think about what what Great Lakes um, values might look like, you know, we we talked about folks who are close to the water. Um, 
in summer cottages, for example, folks who who make a living on the water, whether it's through fishing or boating or tourism, um, having sort of a, that relationship with the Great Lakes. And I think that, and along with recreation, has been the dominant um, sort of perspective of, of what the Great Lakes are and why they matter. Um, but I think, and this is certainly reflected in the Alliance's priorities, over the past several years, we are um, increasingly recognizing that for many people, the relationship that they have with the Great Lakes is it's the water that they're drinking, it's um, the water that they're using to cook food, to bathe their children. And that's when you start to also get into those questions of um, equitable water systems and, and clean water access. And so I think that having um, both the understanding and sort of uh, willingness to sort of look across the many, the many types of relationships folks have to the Great Lakes, um, different political and, and infrastructure imperatives sort of emerge. Annalisa, you brought, I, I really like where you're going with that. I, I you know, I, I think what we want to do is understand the diversity of our cultures rather than find um, uh, one dominant culture and, and respect those differences. And I think water gives you um, so, some, some way to build that sense of community um, and, and bring people together. Whenever people come to Chicago or many Great Lakes cities, they always say, oh my God, I, I had no idea Lake Michigan looked like that. Of course, Lake Michigan is not the biggest, you know, Lake Superior. And you can't see across the lake. Of course, on a really clear day and you squint, you might see a little bit of Gary, Indiana and, and, and even over to Michigan. Um, in the East Coast, you have to drive an hour, two hours to get to the beach, even if you live on the coast often. So it's right, it's our front yard is Lake Michigan in Chicago. And that's true with Cleveland and Toronto and other major cities. So how do we sort of take that commonality and build a sense of community, I think is a great challenge to, to pursue. Thank you all for your thoughtful answers. I, I As a person who grew up here, that idea that you know, as I've sort of gotten older and recognized that a lot of that, what, what I considered Great Lakes culture really was shaped by recreational use and tourism mainly. And that, the, and it's not, it, it was not an inclusive, you know, view of what the, what the actual diversity of Great Lakes cultures is, you know, at, at when I was growing up and early in my career. And so I really appreciate this conversation. I'd love to keep that going at some point. It's a, probably a whole separate webinar on that. But I want to get into before we open it up um, the class itself, and so um, this was a class, you know, really aimed, I think, aimed at at young, emerging young policy professionals, people who are really interested in engaging in this work as a career. Um, and I would love to hear from each of you. Uh, where, what skills you were trying to kind of imbue to your students, and kind of what you thought was most important to lift up as as you as you are sort of mentoring and trying to trying to train emerging poli you know water policy professionals. I could start by first of all thanking Scott and Annalisa's approach to this course. Uh, it taught me as a lecturer and especially our students a different way of learning, a good way of learning meaning that the students were forced to use their knowledge in a productive way, where, which is not often the case in a Nordic context where we have uh, traditional lectures, sometimes seminars. But in this case, they were more or less forced to develop policy recommendations, something that they are not used to, meaning that they need to actually think critically and argue for the case, losing the articles that we provided, they could use others as well. So this is something that as a teacher, I was really appreciative of, and I really uh, like in the future to choose something similar in other courses that we teach here at the Obo Academy University. So this is something I really, really cherish and appreciate uh, the Scott's and Annalisa's input into this. And I want to thank Annalisa as well. You've just done an amazing job in all sides of this course. So we could go on that at, at another time. But yeah, I mean, this is this is a special opportunity. It, it's Sam, all courses aren't taught this way. I mean, there's a lot of 
you know, it's you're starting out, you need some lecture, you need some content. But this was really designed to replicate policy making the real world as much as possible, meaning you had four to five weeks to become an expert as much as you could on these issues. Um, immediately uh, be able to communicate that back in very strict page limits. Um, and then, this is the hard part, is then with imperfect information, develop recommendations about how to improve some aspect of water policy. And I would say that pretty fairly replicates what a lot of people have to do on a regular basis. You do not have complete information. You can't just say, oh, well, there's all these unresolved questions. That doesn't really help. So the final presentation was really meant to be as if you had 10 minutes with the policy advisor to a mayor or a governor. What are you gonna say, what are you gonna say in those 10 minutes? And that's a skill that I think, um, uh, I wanna compliment the, 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 the students at Northwestern who are really great analysts and writers, I think really superb. And then the knowledge that your students had, Sam, was far beyond. A lot of them were PhD students and, and, and working in the sciences and STEM fields. And so, uh, different skill sets coming into the course, um, but in both cases had to stretch themselves to say, okay, here's some policy proposals, here's limitations of it, uh, and, and, and how to communicate that in, in a very short amount of narrative space and time to present. And so it's a lot of fun. And I know in the past, a lot of people have come back to me, including Annalise, and said, oh, can you work with me on, on thesis? Because some extent, this course is almost like a mini thesis kind of approach. You've got 10 weeks to learn something and develop some recommendations as a result. Thanks. And, and while we're while we're sharing all of our gratitude, I will say thank you, Scott, for being willing to work with me um, again and again in different in different capacities. I know I was a little bit glitchy in the first part of this conversation. So I didn't get a chance to say I I am I went through the MPPA program and was a student in the Global Policy Lab. And then Scott became my thesis advisor. And then twice now, this is the second time I've been able to serve as, as the client organization for students and coach them through, through some of the subject matter um, with the framework that Scott just sort of outlined. Um, and, and of course, thank you to Sam and, and Nina in absentia for hosting me in Finland for the first quarter of the year. Um, I will say, in, in, and Scott, you sort of um, pointed to this, the students' cohorts were coming from very different perspective perspectives. Many of the MPPA students, the public policy students, you know, it's a master's program, but it's largely for working professionals. Um, and that's that's historically who it's attracted. And so for for many of them, my understanding at least is is it's about getting up to speed and being able to do exactly what you said. How do I have something to say that's meaningful and as informed um, as it can be? Whereas on the on the Olbo side, uh, we had folks who were truly experts in their own right on many different issues uh, within the C program. Um, but it is that push to, okay, so how do you take what you know, um, apply some some critical thinking and and the strength of your reasoning and your argument um, be the thing that that you're um, being essentially being graded on. And we did use a sort of seminar format where it was there were very there was very little lecturing um you know we're we're adults we we read we we did our homework we read and now let's have a conversation about it um and so that was um that was really valuable because it left enough space for for students to bring their own expertise to the conversation um and ask questions that i think if we had had a rigid sort of lecture structure, we wouldn't have been able to get to. Um, and, and that's especially important when you are talking about um, coming together to um, across these very different contexts and different backgrounds. So I'm really appreciative of, of what we were able to do with this course. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm gonna open it up if there are any questions. And while people are are doing that, you know, please either ask in the chat or feel free to uh, turn your uh, your just raise your hand and come off mute so we'll know that you want to ask something. I I have uh, while people are thinking about that, I have a, a bonus question that wasn't on my current my my list, but came up as I was listening to the responses just now. What about examples of where you know the academy has been? really effective at helping to support and shape uh, water policy. You know, we talked about, I heard, you know, Scott, I think both Scott and Annalisa mentioned the expertise of your students, Sam, and, um, you know, the sort of experts in their field. Do you all have examples of where 
um, where academics uh, have been, you've seen that relationship with policymakers play out really effectively, where that expertise gets put to use in the real world. Especially from an Orb Academy University perspective under the, the C profiling, uh, where legislators and policymakers in general are really keen on relying on academic field is in the technical and uh, natural based scientist field. Uh, the political science perspective of administration is, is a, of a lesser focus because it's, it's rather tricky and uh, difficult to explain because those who participate in this, there is, of course, it's a, they are there for their only term. Whereas, especially in the Baltic Sea uh, or, or Academy context, we have really many distinguished uh, professors in, in marine biologists who has been expert in leading uh, the work, for example, in the Helcom and dealing with this uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan, trying to aspire to a good environmental status of the Baltic Sea in the future, in collaboration, of course, with other scholars in the Nordics and also in Germany and, and to some extent also the Baltic countries. Yeah, so it's a really good question, Joel. Um, Illinois State Water Survey is, is housed at University of Illinois now. Um, it's been like that for some time, and that's one example. But it, that's really more of a professional researcher group housed at the university, as opposed to that. I, I think that's something that we want to talk about maybe in the program, in terms of this. This course obviously has been um, online for the past four or five years. Pre-pandemic went online to be able to capture people across the country. Sometimes we've gotten the Chicago people together for the final presentation, which is kind of fun. But I think the idea of uh, Annalise is right, a couple, some of you on this call today, of course, are from the program, that it does attract people with quite a bit of experience. And that's what I love about it. We might not have a lot of water policy experts in a water policy course, but they've got, I mean, I've had everyone from managers of auto zones who know how to run a business. <laughs> Um, to CNN reporters and everything in between. So, you know, it's an interesting to think about if you're at the school, you know, beyond, you know, the mentorships, the thesis, et cetera, is there, is there some outreach effort? Um, I can think of that in other fields. I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find an example right now, but certainly you've got a lot of involvement in the Chicago area from some of the local universities in community development issues. Um, yeah, I know you guys have been involved with other universities, Alliance for Great Lakes, um, re regarding research and Annalisa probably, and, and you know more about that. But I think that's worth more discussion. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, in, in the sort of policy advocacy space, you know, so much of the time it's about playing the politics, it's about winning the argument, but that's based on research that we, I think, largely rely on academics and professional researchers and scientists to do. Um, and so as that scientific consensus is built, and then there's, you know, advocates out in the world that try to leverage that information, I think that closing, closing that gap where it exists and working more closely with um, sort of academic institutions uh, has always, um, in, in my experience, been really valuable. Um, it's it's different skill sets, as this course highlighted, um, but I think it's an important relationship. And as somebody who's sort of a, I like to identify as a, a lifelong student, um, I, I always appreciate sort of the space that an academic institution can create in which you have um, room for creative and critical thinking, where you have, you know, to, to Scott's example, like AutoZone managers, business business professionals, and news anchors, and um, technocrats, and everyone in between in conversation with each other. Um, that's that's special, and I'm not um, I'm not aware of of institutions that can regularly provide that kind of um, forum and discourse or venue for discourse um, like and like the academy can. Um, and I think between sort of the in the American sort of NGO sector and and academic institutions, there are some really unique opportunities to to make those connections. Just a short comment, sorry, Joe. Just yeah. a, a, a bridge to Annalisa's comments. Uh, one thing I need to emphasize, uh, uh, let's take the city of Turku where Obokrimi is based. There are three universities in the, in the city. Turku is a mid-sized city in Finland. It has rather a leading role in terms of how proactive it is in the Baltic Sea Ruin context. 
And throughout the last decade or so, we have an institutionalized cooperation with civil servants and local politicians who rely on constant basis of information in terms of policy recommendation, input in general. And this then transpires. And this cooperation also has started in other cities in Finland and Sweden and Denmark, and partially also in Norway. So this is transpiring a broader level. I don't know how about the other countries, but this is something that we have a, a real contextual understanding because we are based in a specific city in a specific archipelago area leading into the Baltic Sea. Thank you for those examples. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience. Uh, and as you all know, I can keep talking at length. Uh, but I, I will ask, you know, kind of one more, I'll ask one more maybe close out question that I think is relevant to, especially to the kind of people who are emerging or want to emerge into this work professionally. Um, and that's, you know, one we've talked, we've touched on briefly in this conversation. In both of these watersheds, there are times when, um, certain participants certain governments uh either either drop out or actually work in opposition to the to this work right and so i know yeah uh, sam you mentioned the sort of the, the the no work obligation that that your region has with the russian government right now obviously because of the war in ukraine the invasion of ukraine um and you know in the us we do have elected officials who actually come into office with stated policies of we're going we want to deconstruct the us epa like that's a real thing how do you what is your advice to people coming into the, envir the the environmental policy field the environmental work field knowing that they're going to face these situations where um either their work either they can't do work in a place because they're the, the boundaries are shut or there's actually you know people working in opposition to to kind of the long view of environmental sustainability First of all, you need to be a positive, constructive personality in terms of the always challenges. Uh, that's the first thing to do. But oftentimes, especially as a researcher and scholar in the field of, of environmental governance, both these really, I find myself perhaps too critical sometimes. A lot of things has transpired for the better, even though there are certain, especially in the Baltic series of countries, I assume this is also in the Great Lakes, there's a lot of financial constraints in terms of uh, finding financing for something that nobody actually owns in terms of the Baltic Sea, and we have different interests how to use it. And nobody actually wants to take ownership of the field of question. Uh, for example, the EU would be the likely candidate, but uh, their, their hands are tied in terms of what they can't do and can't do in terms because of the national level and national states, what they want to do. So, I would say that uh, those who would like to pursue an ad ad academic interest in this field, this, first of all, be a positive person in terms of a lot of things has been done for the positive side. A lot of things need to be done. But for example, in the Baltic Sea, we have a lot of issues, not only eutrophication, chemical pollutions, overfishing, alien invasive species, but these have all gone for the better. The problem is, of course, that it takes so many decades that they be showcased for the better. So it's it's a lot of patience, as probably in your world. We, we talked about this previously, that the NGO sector is really strong in the U.S., whereas in the Nordics, it doesn't exist to the same extent. It's more about the local governments have a lot of tasks and they have mandatory possibility to enforce certain things and have rather free role to play relative to the national level that are independent. So the, the key actors are cities, especially in the Nordic context. And they have done a lot of things that they not need to do, but anyhow have done, especially with regard to climate change mitigation. Whereas for example, many of the cities in the Nordics have uh, aspirations to be climate neutral. I think Copenhagen has the most ambitious one in 2025. So it's not far from me. And Turku has 2029, Stockholm has 2030, I think, Helsinki 2030. So a lot of things, especially on a city level, is transpiring in the Nordics, but also in other, other parts of the Baltic Sea. So I'm staying positive. I know we're running out of time, but Joel, I thought you brought up a really good question, really for all fields of people going into public policy, meaning that there will always be, it seems a little more extreme now than in the past, um, people who don't want to listen to the science or take the time to understand. 
And so I think it's a really important skill to learn how to communicate um, the message and the results because um, just showing the numbers for someone who doesn't want to spend the time to look at it, you got to look another way. The other thing is community engagement beyond communications. And the third piece of the puzzle would be power analysis. So you guys at the Alliance and other organizations are really experts at that and understanding how to triangulate and how to reach people, secondary targets, et cetera. I wish Northwestern had a course about that because you really can't be a good public policy advocate without understanding the dynamics of power and influence that is not necessarily rational. It's really based on being able to assemble the power base to influence those officials to, to change course. And um, I will just add, um, I think this is all, um, this is, this is all very, very resonant with me, that that piece about staying optimistic in environmental work, in long-term work, um, staying, staying the course and maintaining, you know, hopefulness and positivity can be a real challenge. And yet it is very much critical. And when you talk about um, sort of how to work with folks who, um, who don't necessarily want to work with you or, or aren't starting in the same, um, even uh, sense of reality. Uh, I think I think it's important to remember the sort of power that that one wields, um, even in the NGO sector, where we're not going to be bringing enforcement actions, the occasional lawsuit maybe, um, but the sort of soft power in normalizing um, clean water values, normalizing you know listening to science. I'm thinking about. I don't want to end on this note, so I'll um, I'll be quick. But I'm thinking about election denialism in the U.S. and sort of the crisis of democracy and the decisions that we and our coalitions partner partners had to make. Are we going to engage with uh, congressional offices that um, are denying the the results of of the most recent presidential election? And those types of decisions and conversations, wherever you land on the other side of them, um, are really important exercises in establishing amongst you know, amongst your your allies, um, sort of where where you stand, and together through a collective impact approach, um, being able to sort of exercise that that form of soft power, um, and so I think there's value uh, truly in in staying optimistic and staying um, staying in cooperation with your with your friends and your partners, um, because it takes a, it takes a collective approach over the long term, both to stay engaged and to have an impact. Thank you, Annalisa, and I, and I don't think that finishes us on a down note. I really appreciate the emphasis on optimism. I think I, I think I heard the summary is optimism, uh, communication, and power, and I would agree on all three fronts. Uh, those are really great values to hold as you think about you know influencing policy, uh, whether it's water or or otherwise, as as Scott said. So um, I think that's a, a great way to wrap things up. And I'm seeing, uh, I appreciate you know, Clara's comment in the chat about what how valuable this course was. And I'm sure all the students who participated um, found it so as well. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour. I'm glad we recorded this conversation because it was a lot of fun. And um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know thank Allison for managing our, our webinar today. And I think we can wrap things up. Thanks, Joel. Thank you so much to our panelists and for everyone for coming today. Really appreciate it. It was super interesting to hear you all discuss this. Um, again, this will be recorded as Joel mentioned again, um, and you know, just keep your eyes peeled. Um, more information will follow about how we're going to distribute this possibly on Canvas or via email. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Take care. Thank you. And thanks for moderating, Joel. Sure.